Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. We're so glad you're joining with us today and a happy Mother's Day. I just want to take a moment and just say how much we love and appreciate and value all of our mothers, uh, both biological and spiritual, as well as all of our women. Uh, we are so um, blessed to have you in our lives and we just so value the vital role that you play uh, in our church community and in our individual families and lives as well. So uh, we bless you today. We're praying for you. We love you guys. Uh, and then before we get into the rest of the service, a couple of announcements. Speaking of women and mothers, Women's Retreat is coming up at the end of the month. I want to encourage you, if you have not si yet signed up for that, ladies, please do so. It's going to be a great weekend away. Uh, for our kids, summer VBS registration is open, so if you would like to have your kids go to VBS, make sure you sign up online for that. The link is in our church Facebook group as well as on the website. And uh, if you're looking to volunteer at VBS, you can also sign up to be a volunteer, and we'd love to have you uh, serve our kids that week. Uh, last thing for today, uh, BC Foursquare Kids Camp is happening in person again at Stillwood this summer, and today is the last day to register for the early bird registration. So registration will still be open for a number of weeks, but if you want to get the early bird price, today is the last day to register for that price, so make sure you jump online uh, to foursquarekidscamp.com, I'm pretty sure it's that, or it's .ca, it, the link's on our we website, and the link's also on our Facebook group if I got that wrong, uh, but make sure you sign up, it's going to be a great time, we're so glad to have camps back again this year. Those are our announcements, I'll be back in a moment to kick off our brand new series in the book of Revelation. Are you excited? Church starts now. One of the great conversations in pop culture revolves around the discussion of what movies, TV shows, and books have been able to nail their endings. You know, to bring a story to a satisfying conclusion, to answer all of the lingering questions, to provide the appropriate emotional payoff. This is no easy task. Now, I, of course, I have my own favorite endings in pop culture. You can probably guess what they are if you've been around here any length of time. Uh, the first one, very obvious, Avengers Endgame. I mean, it's just like, it's there in the title. It is a fantastic ending. It is the culmination of 22 films over the course of a decade, all building into one incredible conclusion. And if you've seen it, you know the moments. There's the moment where Cap proves himself worthy and lifts Thor's hammer. There's that moment where the portals open and you hear the words, Cap, on your left. And then that iconic moment where all the heroes assemble and Captain America finally says the line, Avengers, assemble. It is an incredible film, an incredible ending to an entire like, um, film structure leading towards conclusion. But it is also incredibly validating as a fan, as a fan of comic books for years to be a part of a theater responding to that moment. It was just the best end. It just, it's the best ending. Um, also, I would put Return of the King up there. Uh, as part of the Lord of the Rings series. That, that entire book set was deemed unfilmable by Tolkien himself due to the sheer density of the story, and yet somehow Peter Jackson managed to adapt the books into just a masterpiece of fantasy on film, culminating once again in just a remarkable finale. And if you've seen it, you know the moments here too. It's the Battle of the Black Gate and Aragorn's impassioned speech. It's Sam and Frodo's final ascent of Mount Doom. It's the final shots of the ring bearer sailing off to the west and Sam returning home to the Shire. Like these are the moments that just, they just evoke, they just bring emotion out of you and they just, they burn into your memory. These films have set a high bar for endings. Now one other, one other ending I'll speak of, um, I don't know if it's one of my favorites, but it's definitely memorable. The TV show Lost. It probably has gone on in history as one of the most controversial pop culture endings of all time. People who invested their lives into that, I think it was six or seven seasons of that show, they either loved the ending or they hated the ending. There is no in-between. And I remember uh, I watched the whole series with Erica and with Josh, with Heidi, as it was coming out. And the second, the second that show faded to black and ended, we, I'm not joking, we jumped to our feet in the living room and just started to argue and debate whether it was a great ending or a terrible ending. And we were split down the middle two and two. Now here's a question to, con to consider. Here's a question to consider. Would these endings have anywhere near the impact or evoke the same level of response if I just had walked in and, and catched 
caught the end, but missed the rest of the film or the rest of the TV show. The journey matters. In order for the end of a story to work, I need to be invested in the story from the beginning. I need to be invested throughout the entire journey. And this same principle applies to the book of Revelation. Eugene Peterson, uh, he writes this, No one has any business reading the last book who has not read the previous 65. It makes no more sense to read the last book of the Bible apart from the scriptures than it does to read the last chapter of any novel, skipping everything before it. Now, I can say with confidence that Revelation nails the ending. The payoff is great, and all the emotional beats resonate. But if you don't know the whole story, you might just miss or misunderstand some of the pieces. The context and intent of the revelation are vitally important. It is, it is the culmination of the Holy Scriptures, the final word on everything. It is a vision in the form of a letter written to churches that existed in time and space by a loving pastor who is living in exile due to the persecution of the times. It is prophecy and apocalypse. God is revealing truth and pulling back the curtain. The book of Revelation is the grand unveiling of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. To remove the revelation from its context within the Bible or from the context in which it was recorded is to do it a great disservice, which is why I consider the revelation to be the most misunderstood, misinterpreted, and misused book in all of the Bible. Either we avoid it, or we try to use it as some sort of divine fortune-telling device for the future, or we just reference it here and there to try to sound cool and smart. And when it comes to the use of revelation in an actual church, your options are either none at all, or a concerning amount of time spent in the revelation. At the end of the day, the book of Revelation is best understood as the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is by him, and it is about him. It is a vision of Jesus as he is now. Not the humble teacher we reference so often from the Gospels, but the risen king uh, seated in heaven where he rules and reigns. It is Jesus speaking to his church, providing the manual on how to live for him in the midst of the harsh reality that we often call the end times. That edge we balance on between what is and what is to come. For this reason and the beginning of the revelation only reinforces the idea. I believe that this book is best understood and unpacked within the community of believers. So today we're starting an eight-week series. Just looking at the first three chapters of the Revelation given to John. We are, we are merely dipping our toes into the waters of the Revelation. But I'm sure, I'm sure at some point, for those who really care, we will come back to it and take a longer look at a later time. And some of you might, might ask, why, why just three chapters? Why are we not doing the whole thing? I'll be real. It would be a really, really, really long series to do the entirety of Revelation in one go. Uh, and with a book that is so prone to misinterpretation, I'd like to keep the focus as tight as possible. To the churches in Asia is what we read as Revelation begins. There is purpose in anchoring the message of the Revelation to actual churches. The context of their moment needed the encouragement and correction that we see in the first few chapters of the Revelation. And I would argue that the same is true today. The context of this moment, what we've just come through in the last few years and what is going to come next, requires us to pay close attention to the encouragement and the correction found in these first few chapters of the Revelation. What is Jesus saying to his church, to us, at this moment in time? Let's pray and then we'll, we'll jump into this. So God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the entirety of your word. We pray it today as we turn to a section of your word not often waded into. Uh, God, that you would meet us here in this place, that you would speak clearly, that you would help us to understand parts that are confusing or difficult, that we would see you revealed clearly in the words of these passages, 
And God, pray that you would help us as we wade into it to come into a, a newer understanding, a, a clearer understanding of who you are, uh, what you would have us do, and what it is that you are speaking and saying to us, your church, today. In your name, amen. So before we get to the text, I do need to make a confession. I am not a published scholar. Let's just get that out there. I'm not a published scholar. So much of what I will be sharing in this series is heavily influenced by two authors and two books that I'm very much indebted to. If you're looking for a deep and rewarding dive into Revelation, I highly recommend these two works. Uh, One is Reverse Thunder by Eugene Peterson, and the other one is called uh, Discipleship on the Edge by Daryl Johnson. Uh, Both of these are just fantastic works on the book of Revelation. So let's get down to it. We're going to read the entirety of chapter 1 and then begin to unpack what it's speaking to us. Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength." When I saw him, I felt his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death in Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, Seven lampstands are the seven churches. All right. Easy peasy, right? Everything just totally makes sense there. Nothing more to unpack. We're good to go. (laughs) If you're already feeling overwhelmed by the imagery, have no fear. We're going to unpack this together as we go. And for the sake of simplicity, we're going to focus on three key elements found here in Revelation 1. Elements so key The church must keep these at the core of all that we do. The first element is the Word of God. That is the foundation. The second element is the Christ, Jesus, our Messiah. He is the focus. He is the goal. And the last element is the community of the believers, which is the context that we find ourselves in and must keep ourselves in. Right out of the gate, The Revelation establishes the Word of God as foundational and central to the church. Now, I recognize that these words are specific to the Revelation itself, but the Revelation is also the last word on all that we have read previously. It reinforces the truths that we've discovered in the previous 65 books. So the focus on the word that was spoken is in reference to both the words of the Revelation spoken by Jesus to John and the Word of God contained in the full canon of Scripture. God speaks, and we have access to his word. Don't forsake it. 
immediately we find this incredible verse. Verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Blessed. How often do we use that word in relation to Revelation? Now, I've heard, beware the one who reads the Revelation. I've heard, be afraid of the Revelation. I've heard, even be apathetic towards the Revelation, because it's just, you know, it's for, it's for another time, for like later on. But no, the word used here is blessed. Blessed is the one who reads it aloud, and blessed are those who hear it. Someone put it this way. They paraphrase it as, blessed is the pastor who teaches Revelation, and blessed is the congregation who hears it. That, of course, bodes very well for us over the next eight weeks. Now, the blessing isn't specified, but the promise is clear. Those who take the time to read and hear and absorb the words of the Revelation will be blessed. And thank God that it doesn't say, blessed are those who understand it. But it does go one step further, doesn't it? It says, blessed are those who keep, who keep what is written in it. The word keep used here does not mean keep safe. The church is not instructed to lock the word up somewhere secure and make sure it doesn't go missing. No, the word keep means to keep at it, to keep it in use, to keep it active in everyday life. Scripture is read and heard in order to be practiced. It is not for entertainment. It is not for diversion. It is not for culture. It is not a key for unlocking secrets to the future. It is not a riddle to intrigue the pious dilettante. The intent of Scripture is always to enlist participation, body, and soul. That, again, is from Eugene Peterson. The church must read and hear and do the words of the Revelation. The question might be, well, why why is that? Why do we do that? And it's right there at the end of verse 3. For the time is near. Christ is coming back. His kingdom is is being established. And because of that, the Word of God becomes our foundation. It keeps us on the path that Jesus has laid out for us. Even even when, when reading the Revelation, we need to test our interpretation against the preceding 65 books. Does our understanding align with the rest of Scripture, or did we take a sharp left turn somewhere around the images of the heavenly creatures in the throne room of God? Consider this, when we, th- when we hear of churches or leaders or Christians that have gone off the rails or strayed from the path, what is the common denominator? More often than not, they stray from the path laid out by Scripture. They abandon the Word of God. The Word must remain central in the church. It's the thing that keeps us on track. It's the thing that keeps our feet on a firm foundation. And then there's this interesting third aspect of the word that we see in this first chapter of the Revelation. The word ignites wonder and imagination in the life of the believer. The Revelation is full of imagery and uncommon language. It invites us to step out of our comfort zone. It invites us to, to step out of the usual ways in which we read the Bible and to engage all five of our senses in an immersive vision. Peterson again writes this, It is impossible to read the Revelation and not have my imagination aroused. The Revelation both forces and enables me to look at what is spread out right before me and to see it with fresh eyes. It forces me because being the last book in the Bible, I cannot finish the story apart from it. It enables me because by using the unfamiliar language of apocalyptic vision, my imagination is called into vigorous play. For example, we'll put this into illustration here. For example, did you catch the mixed up senses in verse 12? Verse 12 says, I turned to see the voice. Think about that for a second. I turned to see the voice. But like, but like usually you hear a voice, right? You don't, you don't see a voice, you hear a voice. Not, not in the Revelation. Here John turns to see the voice. The revelation is full of imagery that needs to be heard in order to be seen, which is why the book is to be read aloud. So I ask the question as we 
and begin to walk through this. Is your imagination engaged yet? Has your sense of wonder been woken up? And most importantly, have you ever read the Bible like this before, beyond just words on a page, but engaging all of us in an imaginative reading of the Scripture? We discover fairly quickly as we go that Jesus is the main character of the Revelation, reinforcing what the previous 65 books have already revealed to us, that Jesus is kind of a big deal. He must always remain the central figure of our faith. Christ is the goal upon which the gaze of the church must be fixed. Now, Jesus is introduced in Revelation chapter 1 with a, with a familiar resume. Verses 4 to 8 lay out his accomplishments in case we are in need of a refresher. It says, him who was and who, who is and who was and who is to come. It says that he is the faithful witness. He was one who, was, who revealed truth. He is the firstborn of the dead, I, meaning he, he resurrected. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth, the one who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, the one who made us to be a kingdom, priests to serve God the Father, the Alpha and the Omega. This we know. This is familiar. We've we've read these parts before. But then John turns to see the voice. And we find ourselves face to face with a Jesus we haven't seen before, the cosmic Jesus, the glorified Christ. I think we become so familiar with the Jesus of the Gospels that we become unfamiliar with the Jesus of this time and this place, the one who holds all things together and and sits at the right hand of the Father. John's vision trains us to re-see Christ. Here in chapter 1, we find seven specific descriptors all revealing a key aspect of his nature or his character. Now, the number seven comes up a lot in the Revelation as it symbolizes completion or perfection. So it's a fitting number for Jesus. I'm going to read again from Revelation chapter 1, the description here of Jesus. It says, uh, starting in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. And before we hit the seven descriptors, we get a lesson in fashion. Before we know what the Son of Man looks like, we know what he does because clothing defines the role. And the clothing we see here reveals to us the Son of Man as a priest, a mediator, a bridge builder as the language of the time conveys. Jesus presents God to us and he also presents us to God. His death closed the gap between God and man, and he is still in the business of building bridges between the sinner and the divine. Now, let's take a a couple minutes and break down the imagery that we see here because it is incredibly fascinating. The first thing we see says that the hairs of his head were white. There's a variety of interpretations of this, but they all kind of coalesce in a, in, a, in, a, in a similar image. The hairs of his head were white, speaking of purity, holiness, agelessness. He is eternal, wisdom, authority, justice. The second thing we see or we read is his eyes like a flame of fire. It speaks of the purifying nature of Jesus because fire penetrates and it transforms. Holiness gets inside us, and when it gets inside of us, it begins to change us. His eyes like a flame of fire. The third thing we see, his feet were, uh, feet were like burnished bronze. The strong and magnificent base upon which his kingdom is set. Now, bronze is a combination of iron and copper. Iron is strong, but it rusts. Copper won't rust, but it's pliable. You, when you combine the two, the best quality of each is preserved. The strength of iron and the endurance of copper. So when it talks about his feet being like burnished bronze, it's talking about the fact that the rule of Christ is set on this base, and his rule, his kingdom is strong, and it will endure. 
The fourth thing that we see, his voice at the roar of many waters. Now, if you've heard the sound of many waters, the roar of surf, you know that it is an awesome sound and it is a commanding sound. And that is the image we have here of his voice, that his voice is awesome and it is commanding. The fifth thing that we see, his right hand holds seven stars. Now, right hand means ready for use. What is in my right hand is what I am, what I am capable of doing, what I am ready to do. And this image of seven stars portrays the idea that Christ, he runs the cosmos. He controls the universe. From, from our earliest childhood memories, maybe you have that song in your head that he's got the whole world in his hands. That's the image here of the seven stars in the right hands, that he is in control of everything. Number six, the mouth produces a sharp two-edged sword. It's a picture of what takes place when Jesus speaks, and it's... Um, in agreement with what we read previously in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to, to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The words of Jesus cut through the noise and the nonsense of life, and they cut to the core of who we are. And then finally, image 7, we see his face was like the sun shining. God revealed in Christ is warmth and sunlight, the personal embodiment of the blessing of God. Now, here's where things get really interesting, because the seven descriptors here in chapter 1, they form an interesting pattern. And I'm pulling this from, um, once again, from Eugene Peterson's work. He highlights this, this very interesting pattern. The items are arranged symmetrically. The first and last items, the white head and shining face, are most important. Forgiveness and blessing are the first and final impressions. The second and sixth items, eyes and mouth, are the organs of relationship. Sight and sound being the chief means of communication, Christ shows God to be in relationship with us. The third and fifth items, feet and right hand, are the paired members of the body that represent capability. Feet give solid, solid underpinning and mobility. The right hand is the instrument of the executive will. God is capable and active on our behalf. The fourth item in the series of seven is the voice. It is at the center. All prophetic and apostolic words converge in this voice that thunders sounds of passionate love and urgent mercy. The images we find ourselves studying in Revelation are not accidental. There is purpose in the design. This image of Jesus communicates all that we need to know about him. It is complete, for he is perfect. He is the one who commands both our attention and our affection. And so we put him in his proper place at the center. Which brings us to the final important piece of Revelation chapter 1. Where, where is Jesus in the image we see here? It says, In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Jesus stands in the midst of his church, and he is a message for the church. It is assumed that the revelation will be read and heard in church. For a believing community is the context for the life of faith. And you go, yeah, 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 I know that. I know that. That's, that's old. But here's the thing. When, when we understand, when understood in light of the historical time the Revelation was written, the idea of a believing community is seen in a new light. In verse 9, we read that John was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Patmos, if you don't know, is an island 10 miles off the coast of modern-day Turkey. The Roman government at the time maintained rock quarries on the island, which is where they sent criminals and enemies of the state to spend the rest of their lives. So why is John there? Well, he's already given us that answer, hasn't he? He said, I was on the island on account, on account, the reason I'm there, I'm on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Life was not easy for the followers of Jesus at this point in history. With each new ruler that takes power, some new horror awaits the church. At the time of John, Domitian was the emperor. 
And he was a profoundly insecure man who lived in constant fear of being overthrown. To combat these fears, Domitian ordered all citizens and subjects of the empire to worship him as Lord and God, which was enforced through the act of going to the temple built in his honor, taking a, a pinch of incense, throwing it on the fire of the altar, and declaring allegiance to Lord Caesar, Domitian himself. As you can imagine, John refused to do this. There is only one Lord and God, and that's Jesus Christ, not you, emperor. So I'm just going to take a pass on this whole proclaiming allegiance and sprinkling incense. Hence, we find John on Patmos, separated from the churches that he pastors and from the people that he loves. It's a setting that seems to call into question the truths of the gospel. You know, we hear the gospel say the kingdom of God is near. And at this point in history, the people of God are going, no, it's not. Like, take a look around. The kingdom is not near. Things are not good. You know, the gospel would say, Jesus is Lord. And the people this time would say, are, are you sure? Are you sure he is? Additionally, it was, a, it was a politically dangerous time for Christ's followers to assemble together. A private faith would have been safer and more convenient. And yet what we see in the revelation is Jesus in the midst of the churches with a message, a vision for his people. Write what you see and send it to the churches. Gather together to read and hear the word of Jesus for his church. We can't ignore the significant emphasis placed on the importance of the community of believers gathered together despite the context and culture they find themselves in. Alone would have been easier and safer. But the biblical witness consistently challenges our privatism and individualism. The life of faith must be developed within the context of community. Now, the revelation is both letter and prophecy and apocalypse. And that last one is most interesting. For in its simplest definition, apocalypse means to unveil. In the midst of this, of this hostile environment, in the midst of churches without a pastor, a pastor removed from his people, an empire at odds with an eternal kingdom, Jesus speaks to his church and says, things are not as they seem. Things are not as they seem. My kingdom, my kingdom is coming. I am Lord of all. And you, my church, will be victorious. Things are not as they seem. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I like to win. It doesn't happen often. In fact, the running joke in our family when it comes to games is that dad always loses, and they're not wrong. I tend to lose far more than I win when we play games. But on those rare occasions that I do win, it really feels good. The consistent message of the revelation is this. Jesus wins. In fact, he is already won. He is already victorious. And with this knowledge in hand, it reframes how we read it and understand it. Revelation is not a crystal ball revealing esoteric secrets that enable one to escape the harsh realities of life on earth. Rather, it is a down-to-earth manual on how to be a disciple of Jesus facing the harsh realities of life on the earth. In particular, how to do this the way Jesus did and does. So back to our opening question. What is Jesus saying to his church today? He's saying, take heart, for I have overcome. The promise of the revelation is one of victory. In spite of what struggles you might be facing in this very moment, in spite of the context of our time and the culture around us, in spite of the challenges facing the church, and I'm not, I'm not talking about our specific church, but just the church in general, despite the challenges facing the church in the world right now, the image painted for us in Revelation is one of a victorious people and a victorious church because we serve a victorious God. Our Savior has already won. So as we take time over the next number of weeks to study the words of Jesus to the seven churches in Asia, let's remember that these churches which existed in time and space are also archetypes. If you take any seven churches from any point in history, you will find the same challenges, the same concerns, the same encouragements, the same good works. Take our church from any point in history, and you would, may also find the same. Let's not be so proud as to say, that will never or that could never be us. Rather, 
as we embark on this journey through the very beginning of the Revelation, let us hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. Let us take heed of Christ's warnings and his encouragements, and let us press into what he has called us to do so that we may be victorious. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray in a second, and we're going to close today with communion. We're going to make sure on this wild journey we're about to go on through Revelation, we're going to make sure that we root everything in the very foundation of our faith, the crucified Christ. For the victory we proclaim today, the victory we're going to be talking about over the next number of weeks is only possible because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So let's pray, and then let's take communion together. God, we thank you for your words today. Words that maybe we haven't heard before, maybe words that are fresh, different, challenging. God, pray that your word would take root and begin to help us see you and understand you with fresh eyes and a fresh mind. God, I just pray for us as a church today as we embark on this journey together that you would awaken wonder within us, that we would come to the scripture in a new way, that you would ignite our imagination, that we would immerse ourselves in the imagery and the story that's unfolding. God, help us to be excited and full of awe and wonder when we come to the text. God, I pray for understanding. I pray that you would speak clearly and that your voice, the voice of the Spirit, the voice of truth, would be heard above everything else, including my own voice. God, would you help us to clearly understand what it is that you are speaking to us at this time, at this place, in this moment. And God, I pray that you'd help us to put into practice what we hear you say. You know, that is probably one of the most important th pieces from this morning is the idea that we hear, we read, and we hear, and we keep the word, that we put it into practice. So God, I pray you'd help us not just to fill our heads with random information and facts of the revelation, but God, that this would uh, spur us to action, that we would put into practice that which you are speaking to us. And above all, God, I pray you'd help us in our own lives, in the life of our church, to keep the word as the foundation, to keep Jesus Christ as the goal, that which we fix our eyes upon, and help us not to forsake the community of believers, the gathering together and the, the working out of our faith within that context. God, we thank you for these gifts that you've given to us, your church. And God, we pray that we would not forsake them. We pray that we would not walk away from them. We pray that we would keep them as the integral core of all that we do. The last thing is this. If you're watching today and you have never made a decision for Jesus, and you've heard me talk about a lot of wild things about him, but something inside of you is just resonating with this, with this man, with this Savior, that's you, I'd love for you to pray along for me today and, and invite him to be part of your life. So if this is you, if you would like to make a decision for Jesus today, just pray this along with me. Jesus, I acknowledge my need for you. I recognize that you died on a cross for my sins, that you rose again victoriously so I can walk in newness of life. Today I ask that your love and your grace, your peace and your mercy would come flooding into my life and that I would have the strength to walk out the path that you have for me. I commit to following you. Jesus, I love you. Amen. If that was you, we want to celebrate with you. Let someone know. Let the church office know. Let the person that invited you to church know. Uh, we want to celebrate with you that incredible decision. And as I said, we're going to close today with communion. I think it's a fitting way to ground what we've been talking about. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes this, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if you would take the element that represents the body, whether it's bread or cracker, hold it in your hand. 
Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your body that was broken for me, for the sacrifice you made on behalf of not just me, but all of humanity. God, take this moment to remember and to thank you and to praise you for what you did. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you break that and let's eat together. And then taking the cup. Jesus, we thank you for your blood poured out for us. We thank you for the image it holds of just washing us clean and just the unending fountain of love and grace and mercy that you have for us. So God, once again, we thank you and we praise you for what you did on the cross for each one of us. Amen. Let's drink together. Jesus, we thank you. We ask that you would seal up all that you have spoken this morning, that we would hold tight to your word. We'd hold tight to you. We love you. Amen. I want to encourage you to stick with us over the next number of weeks. We're going to be going through these letters to the churches from the book of Revelation. It's going to be an exciting series to go through. Uh, as always, I just want to let you know we love you guys. We care for you. Please let us know if there's anything we can be praying for for you. Uh, if you're interested in connected to anything, come to any of our events, please just contact the church office. We'd love to make sure you have the information you need uh, to be a part of all that we're doing. And we will see you soon. Have a great week.